Good evening. It's Teresa in the garden for Ephesians chapter 4. Last week, Paul was praying for the people in Ephesus that they would know the depth and the height and the width of God's love for them and that they would be strengthened in that knowledge to keep them close to the Lord. And he said in chapter 3 that he was a prisoner in Jesus Christ. But in chapter 4, he says, I'm a prisoner for serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I told you a week ago and the week before that, <clears throat> he didn't mind being in jail because he was able to accomplish something he probably would not have been able to accomplish if he had been out preaching the gospel to different people. And that was to write Colossians and Philemon and Ephesians and Galatians. And we are studying Galatians right now. <clears throat> so he says, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Think about it. Do you think you are living your life worthy of the calling that God has given you? I think all of us can probably improve on that. I know I certainly can. He said, always be humble and gentle. I am not always humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. I'm not always patient, and I don't always make allowance for other people's faults. I'm just being real with you. I, I, don't, I don't do this all the time. I try, but I fail quite frequently. I remember when I was reading through the Bible, doing a Bible study, and when I got to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, I just quit reading because I got so discouraged that I couldn't be patient and kind and loving all the time. But reading through this time in the Bible, doing this study with y'all, I realized that I was trying to do that without the help of the Holy Spirit. And even though I now have the help of the Holy Spirit, I still don't always do it. I still don't always choose that way of love. And that's what Paul says, because of your love, God loved us and forgave us of everything. And that's how we're supposed to be grooming to do that, that the Holy Spirit inside of us is grooming us to be able to do all things in love. I still don't do that yet, but I am trying, and I do get humbled every single day. You know, I don't think that's a bad thing. When you take a test, it's not so much whether you pass or fail, but it's an assessment of where you are right then, and I learn I learn every single day. So I'm doing the best I can, and I'm sure you are also. So let's just make an agreement that we are going to try to do the very best that we can. Paul says, make every effort <clears throat> to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. We learned last week that because we believe in Jesus Christ and He put His Holy Spirit inside of us, we are then united in spirit, and that's what Paul is talking about, to make every effort to stay united in the spirit, to remember we are all united in the spirit. He says, binding yourselves together with peace. Another place in scripture, Jesus says, be at peace with all people as much as possible. And we all know that there's some people, that it's very difficult to stay peaceful with, but we should make every effort. For there is just one body and one spirit, just as, you, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. And that hope is that we will be with Jesus forever. So we're supposed to remember we are united in spirit and bind ourselves together in peace and remember we are one body. We are one spirit. Then Paul says, There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
one God and Father who is over all and in all and living throughout all. Yes, people that haven't accepted Jesus Christ, God is still living in them, through them, when they allow him to be, but they're not guided by the Holy Spirit until they ask to be. And if you don't ask to be guided by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit stands back and waits until that time where you realize you really can't do it on your own. You really do require help, and he's right there to help you. And before that even, you have to ask Jesus to pay for your sins. He did it already. All you got to do is accept that he did it and ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Then he says, however, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That's why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crown, crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Some theologians believe that Paul was speaking to the freedom. I have a mosquito here. He is an ex-mosquito now. Paul says that Jesus ascended to the heights, which means heaven, and he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Some theologians believe this scripture, which is found in Isaiah, in Isaiah and tweaked just a little bit here, is speaking when Jesus died on the cross <clears throat> and descended into Hades, the bosom of Abraham, to take the people who had been covered by the blood of bulls and goats and had died and gone to the bosom of Abraham. He gathered them together and took them with him to heaven. That was their reward for doing what God told them to do. They were covered by the blood, but the blood of bulls and goats could not give them that full coverage and that full salvation that Jesus did. But once Jesus died, God in his compassion had Jesus to go to the bosom of Abraham and gather up these people and take them to heaven. He led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Well, he gave them that gift of eternal life. But there's other theologians that say what he was talking about was when he came here and set us free from the captivity and bondage that Satan had us under with our sins. And then he gave us gifts. Some of those gifts we know of as the gift of pastoring, teaching, administration, the gift of mercy, the gift of healing, the gift of generosity. Those are the gifts of the Spirit that he gives to us. Paul talks about those administrative gifts and the gifts of pastoring and teaching here in just a moment. Those are our gifts that edify the church. But whether he's talking about the gifts that are given to the people who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior or the gifts that he gave of salvation to the captives that he took out of Abraham's bosom, I don't know. I guess we'll find that out in heaven. Paul mentions it here because it is important. Then he talks about, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. Yes, God was incarnated in the body of Jesus Christ to come here and show us who he really was and to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, pay for our sins. He had to be a perfect sacrifice and only God himself could be perfect. Jesus is God. He is also the son of God, but he is one person. The same as the Holy Spirit is one person with Jesus and God the Father. He's the same one who descended, and he's the same one who ascended higher into the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. God had to come into a physical form, pay for our sins, 
go back to heaven and then send back his Holy Spirit so that he could truly fill the whole world with himself. He created the whole world, but he filled the whole world with his spirit when he sent back his Holy Spirit to the world. Paul says, now these are gifts that Christ gave to the church. I told you he was going to speak on this. These are the offices that he gave to the church. And their purpose is to teach the church, which is all of us, all about God, his love, how he wants us to live our lives. He's poured this out on us. And he's given these special gifts so that we could be taught and then pour it out on other people. All of us are ministers. All of us are teachers. All of us are able to spread the gospel, but we have to be equipped. And these offices, these gifts of offices, were given to certain people by the Holy Spirit so that we could be taught. Now, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip. This Greek word equip means to mend, to fix, to gather together, to lift up, to encourage, to fill up. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, which is the body of Christ. Remember a couple of weeks ago in Ephesians, we learned that we are one body. The church is one body and the head is Christ. So the head thinks and tells the body what to do. And if the body obeys, then work is accomplished. If the body doesn't obey, the work is not accomplished. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. We don't measure ourselves up to our neighbors or our fellow church members. We don't measure ourselves up to our spouses. We don't compare ourselves one to the other. The only one that we are to compare ourselves to is Jesus. And we will find ourselves lacking, but that doesn't mean we are to despair and give up. That just means we are to ask the Holy Spirit to help us even more grow into that full maturity of the Lord. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We are immature until we grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ. We act immaturely, we fight, we bicker, we stay angry, we act like children. And then he says, we won't be tossed around and blown about by every wind of new teaching. I remember I was a member of a church once that there was this new fad called Holy Laughter. And for a month of Sundays, literally, for four Sundays straight in a, way, or in a row and four Wednesdays, nothing was preached for the pulpit because there would be this, what they called holy laughter. Somebody would start laughing and then everybody would start laughing and they would say, we're just drunk in the spirit and we're getting all kinds of healing through this laughter. It didn't build up the church. I think it was a ploy by Satan to just delay our teaching and our maturing in the Lord because nothing was taught. And I went to the pastor and I told the pastor, I, I can't keep coming here because nothing is being taught. I'm not learning anything. And he said, well, I don't want to quench the spirit. Well, I don't think that pastor was listening to the spirit of the Lord. I think he was listening to a spirit, maybe other people's opinions, it's really important that we're not tossed around by every fad that comes in. A new aspect of religion. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. I teach chapter by chapter, verse by verse, 
book by book from Genesis to Revelation because that's the way that I think we can learn the best. Most of the pastors I listen to are part of Calvary Chapel. And this started by Pastor Chuck Smith in California way back in the 70s. Uh, some of you may have seen the movie, The Jesus Revolution. This is the church that started that Jesus Revolution. He got very angry because he came to church one morning and there was a sign out in front that said, no shoes, no service. And he went in and asked who had the audacity to put this note on the front of our door. And some of the elders came and said, we did. We just got new carpet. And these hippies that are coming in here are barefooted. And they're making stains on our carpet. And Pastor Chuck said, just rip the carpet out. I don't want anything to hinder people learning the word of God. Jesus did the same thing when he came in on his triumphant em entry into Jerusalem the week before he was crucified. And he went into the temple. And there were people, Gentiles, that wanted to worship, but the place that they were allowed to come into was filled with money changers and people that were selling sacrifices at exorbitant prices. He threw over the tables, and they weren't plastic tables like we have now that we set up at church. They were heavy wooden tables, and all the coins went flying everywhere. And he opened the cages of the doves and let them out. Open the pens where the sheep were being held together because these people were exploiting, these Jewish people were exploiting the Gentile people that wanted to come in and worship God. He said, my father's house is a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. Well, God's house is also not a place to lead God's little ones, newbies in the faith, into strange false doctrines either we should put a stop to it when it starts coming into our churches unfortunately chuck smith is no longer alive and the person that took over his church there in costa Mesa is not teaching verse by verse chapter by chapter and bringing in strange doctrines i heard about that this week and and I'm very saddened by this because I really like that Calvary churches preach the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. They don't preach on series. They don't preach on topics. They preach the Word of God from the beginning to the end. And when they get to the end, they start all over again. And then their congregation gets a deeper and deeper, more mature teaching of the Word of God. I believe this is the way the Word of God is supposed to be preached. I think it's very good. Paul says, We will no longer be immature like children being tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Have you been given a job to do at your church fellowship? It's a very important part to work out. You might not think it's very significant, but God does. If the people that are supposed to clean the toilets don't clean the toilets, then every time someone wants to go to the bathroom, they're going to go, oh man, I don't want to go back to that church anymore. They have filthy bathrooms. <clears throat> if your job is to be an usher at your church, and you greet people with a frown on your face, people are gonna go, I don't wanna be at that church. People don't even, they're even not even nice to you when you come in the door. If your job is to hand out programs and you're just going, here, take this, people aren't going to receive it very well. If the pastor gets up and just yells the whole time and 
you're gonna feel like you've been scolded like a little child. If the people that are deacons do not come around and keep order in the sanctuary, there's not gonna be any order. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Then Paul says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, don't continue living any longer as the Gentiles do. I'm going to translate that word Gentile into the world because that's how it really applies in our world today. With the Lord's authority, I say this, don't keep living like the people in the world do because they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Before I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, I was a mess. And I was a mess for a long time even afterwards because it took a long time for the Holy Spirit to get me to throw off my old way of life. And I did dip back and forth and back and forth until I made a full commitment to follow Jesus. I was saved, and the Holy Spirit was trying to do a great work inside of me, but I was very rebellious, and I didn't follow instructions very well. But finally, I had some things happen to me that made me decide I, I don't want that kind of life anymore. Paul is saying voluntarily, take off those old stinky clothes. Stop walking around like you are not a child of God. Put on the new nature in Christ Jesus and walk around like a child of light. He says, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. I have let anger control me a lot. Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your anger, for it gives the enemy a foothold. When you are angry and you go to bed angry and you sleep that night, the enemy just puts dreams in your mind that makes you be even anger, angrier. You wake up the next morning and every day you keep that anger inside of you or bitterness or resentment, whatever it is that you've got going on. It grows. It grows inside of you just like weeds in my garden. And it chokes out the good things in my garden that I want to grow. So I have to do weeding quite frequently. I, this last past week, engaged a two little girls to help me do some weeding because my weeds were getting out of control. That's when you ask people to help you pray. When you are in an area that you are struggling with your old nature, ask someone to pray for you. Help, get some help pulling out the weeds. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry for anger gives a foothold to the devil. If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then generously give to other people in need. Thieving comes from greed. And one way to break that puppy is to start giving. Get a good job. Make money and give whatever the Lord tells you to give. It's like an attitude of gratitude transcends depression. A generous heart transforms a greedy heart. All these things Paul is telling us is a good word how to put off the old nature and put on 
the new nature in Christ Jesus. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words would be an encouragement to those who hear them. He's not just talking about cussing, though that is a big part of it. I don't think Jesus walked around cussing. And when he spoke to people, even if he had to speak to people firmly about something, it was still in a space of love. Every single one of us in the church is the bride of Christ. I don't think it makes Jesus very happy when we speak in a manner to his bride that's not kind and loving. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Well, that's called grieving the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit by living a life that is not godly, by keeping our old nature on. It grieves parents when their children do things that are wrong. And don't for one minute think that it doesn't grieve God when we do things that are wrong, because it does. He said, remember, God has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. He's claimed you as his own child. And he has said he will keep claiming you and redeem you on the day of redemption. Then he gets down to the nitty gritty and he says, and as I'm saying this, please let the Holy Spirit convict your heart because that's what he does to show you you're putting that old dirty shirt back on. It stinks. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Yeah. You were forgiven, and in order to be like Christ, you must also forgive. And it's not always easy, and you cannot do it on your own. It's okay to get angry when you're getting angry about an injustice done to someone else, but when you get angry about an injustice done to you, that's called pride. Yeah, it is. And you're supposed to take that anger about the injustice done for you before the Lord and have him explain it to you, why he allowed that to happen to you, how it was supposed to keep you in check, put you in, an humble, in a humble place, or whatever. But when you are angry about an injustice done for someone else and you champion them by trying to help right the wrong, that's what Jesus did when he went into the temple, turned over the tables, even made a whip. He did this twice. One time he made a whip and started beating those money changers. That was a righteous anger. But both times he did that, he disappeared. It wasn't that he was afraid of what they were going to do to him. But I believe it's because he had to go join back with God the Father and get help. To remove that anger out of him because he was in a physical body so it either didn't make his body sick or he didn't sin because anger can make you sin disappointment or hurt feelings can be turned into anger really easy we're supposed to take every thought captive to Christ when we do this we allow the Holy Spirit to help us with the emotions that we have emotions and these physical bodies are very fickle. You cannot live your life off your emotions. You take them before the Holy Spirit and let him groom them, burn up what is not necessary, what is not kind, what is not good or loving, and keep that which is kind, good-hearted, tender-hearted, and loving. I'm going to see you next week for chapter 5 where Paul talks about living in the light of the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn a lot. 
I'll be waiting right here, and we'll pick it up next week in the garden.